The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwm.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Over 360 species recorded over the years. Hornsby is one of the better spots to bird in Central Texas. It, it's pretty intense, you concentrate, so you just try to stay calm. Remember, thing one, thing two. My favorite story is D-Day Plus 50, which commemorated the 50th anniversary of D-Day on the battleship Texas. When we did get to the beach over there, we had to feel our way along to be sure we didn't hit a landmine. Texas Parks and Wildlife, taking Texans outside for 30 years. Four Rocky Ducks. It's a frigid morning just after sunrise, and these volunteers are counting birds. Here's the killdeer if you want to look in the scope. On the second Saturday every month, sponsored by Travis Audubon, there's a monthly bird survey, and we do rain or shine, hot or cold. Wasn't it like 70 degrees three days ago? If the dedication of these birders through freezing temperatures and high winds is at all surprising, you may be more surprised to learn where this survey is taking place. The variety of birds you can see here is pretty surprising, I think, for most folks. These ponds on the edge of Austin may resemble a nature preserve, but the bigger picture and the smell reveal something else. We're here at Hornsby Bend, which is the facility that recycles all of Austin's sewage solids, which is a euphemism for poop. Yes, for Austin's sewage, this is the end of the line, but it is also a laboratory. I'm Kevin Anderson. I'm a geographer. I work for the Austin Water Utility, and I run the Center for Environmental Research at Hornsby Bend. It's a unique site, 1,200 acres along three and a half miles of the Colorado River, where all of Austin's sewage and yard waste is recycled. There's a, a farm and a bottomland forest, and treatment ponds that are famous for birding, many different things that we can use for environmental research. Double crested. The bird monitoring is just the beginning of the research here. The checklist for Hornsby Bend is over 360 species recorded over the years. Studies focus on ecology and urban sustainability. The sewage here doesn't go into a landfill, it gets recycled, and about a million gallons a day arrives here. The biosolids management plan ensures all that waste isn't wasted. That material comes here through pipelines from our wastewater plants, it goes into a thickening building, and from there it'll go into anaerobic digesters. We heat the sludge to body temperature, and we recreate the ecosystem in our intestines. Disease organisms die off, and digestion continues. Those pipes are capturing the biogas, mainly methane, and heating the digesters. Once pathogens have been digested naturally, water is sent to the ponds and solids are recycled as fertilizer and compost. We grow the hay as a way of recycling the nutrients in that manure or biosolids that we put on the fields. The other way we recycle the sewage provides an opportunity to recycle another city waste stream. And that's all the leaves, grass, branches that are collected curbside in the city of Austin. That amounts to 15% of all the city's garbage. And that material with a portion of the biosolids is made into compost. 
Diverting sludge and yard waste saves hundreds of thousands of dollars in landfill costs. Turning it into compost generates additional funding for the operations at Hornsby Bend while nourishing soil all over town. All the while, nutrient-rich pond water supports a food chain that draws wildlife and city dwellers who want to see wildlife. I end up driving all kind of weird ways out here, backwards, forwards. He's about a 10 inch long bird, but he's just very nicely framed in good light. Greg Lasley is a nature photographer. For Greg, Hornsby Bend is an endless source of subject matter. It's really nice reflection on him in the water. They're really neat looking birds. I spend a lot of time in the vehicle because a vehicle makes a good blind. You just never know what's going to turn up here. There's just a world of discovery to be made if you just take the time to look. It's hard to think of a sewage facility as a gym, but to somebody who's interested in birds, it is. An area like Hornsby, even though we're right near the city of Austin, there's an amazing variety of wildlife. Butterflies, dragonflies, birds, reptiles and amphibians. My philosophy is if you just get out in nature and spend time looking, uh, things show themselves to you. I spent 25 years in law enforcement uh, on the Austin Police Department, and I'm retired from that now but I would come out here on my days off and look at birds and wildlife. I think anybody that has a job that sometimes can be difficult, uh, it, was, it was important for me, good for me, still is. It just rejuvenates me. Finding natural rejuvenation at places like Hornsby Bend is not unique to Austin. In fact, from west Texas to east and north to south, Many cities and towns have opened the gates to similar nature havens in their urban margins. These kinds of places are, are known in the parlance as non-traditional habitat in cities. That's a least turn, isn't it? I call it marginal nature. You're right. Yeah, foresters. foresters. Lots of people come to places like sewage ponds to observe nature. As Texas urbanizes, places like Hornsby Bend become more and more important. Hornsby Bend's proximity to people and the river also make it a good place to learn about the natural world. Everyone here? So the river is right about here right now. Every year we've celebrated Earth Day by doing a field class for a high school group from Austin. Bluegills have the long patch like this. They're learning about the biology of the river, the chemistry of the river, and the hydrology of the river. There we go. We just hit the water inside the well. 8.8. .8. We gather experts and get the kids literally in the river learning about it. Keep on swinging, keep on swinging. You're doing great. Drag it along the bottom. For students and everyone else. You guys see anything? Caring about conservation requires learning about natural resources in the first place. <laughs> there you go, you got it. Get engaged in understanding the Earth's ecology and you'll learn to protect it. And that understanding can be gained from all sides of a site, like Hornsby Bend. That's your poop. I want to grow some hay. Taking the waste of the city and putting it back into a soil ecosystem, that's sustainable. Oh, it's beautiful. Beauty, in many forms, can be found in unlikely natural places. The fundamental reality of Texas is we're an urban state now. Uh, Red-bellied woodpecker. If you're willing to overlook some visual clutter or funky aromas. <laughs> the smell's not so bad. Nature may be closer than you think. And it has a lot to offer those who take the time to look. You know, you hope for the best and train for the worst, and this is training for the worst right here. Helicopter goes down. It's the best simulated uh, training we can get. Here today, we're doing what's called Hewitt. 
helicopter underwater egress training. It's learning how to get out of the helicopter in the event that we're working out of one and it goes down in the water. Most helicopters will uh, flip over, is what they tell us when they go into the water, and so that's why we're doing some training in case it does happen in real life. It's pretty intense, you concentrate, so you just try to stay calm. Remember, thing one, thing two. It is definitely more mental than physical. It, it is fun, we'll, we'll have some fun discussions and, when we get done. The biggest thing is the panicking. If you can get over the panicking and get, just get your mind right about it, when you're out in the real world, and something like this happens, you need to know that you're gonna get out of it. And as long as you got that beat, there's no problem at all. Working with the NBL, which is a neutral buoyancy laboratory, we're actually training in the same pool the astronauts are training in. In the pool right now, there are astronauts underwater right now training in the space station that's underwater. Who would have ever thought Texas Game Wardens would be training at NASA? Oh God, this is awesome. I mean, it's the best of the best, right? And uh, that's where you try to set yourself up for success. And, and, and by setting muscle memory and, and by repeating it over and over, uh, hopefully the outcome will be good when you need it. They're mostly up in here. Everything. They're just clouds of them. They're just clouds of them. Now, this is my business and where I live in uh, South Travis County. We've never seen this before, half a dozen at a time maybe. Now, I don't know, they're hundreds, thousands. They look like leaves, brown leaves, so you don't really even notice the numbers of them. It's one of their stopover points on the way to Mexico. It's a Monarch Motel. These same monarchs right here today that we're seeing, those that survive through the winter will come back through Texas next uh, March and April. In the spring, these will get as far north as Kansas. Um, so a, a distance of some 3,000 miles. Phenomenal. That's a pretty amazing sight. Just lucky that it's 10 feet from my house. Really, really magical. It was 30 years ago that the Texas Parks and Wildlife television series, originally known as Made in Texas, got its start. Randall Maxwell is one of more than 30 producers, photographers, writers, and editors who have contributed to the show since its first broadcast in 1985. Hi, my name is Randall Maxwell. I was a producer on the Texas Parks and Wildlife television series from 1991 to 1996. My favorite story is D-Day Plus 50, which commemorated the 50th anniversary of D-Day on the battleship Texas. Several veterans who had been on the Texas showed up. I was able to talk to them, get their stories, their experiences, visit parts of the ship with them, and it moved me to hear this historical retrospective and coming directly from memories of these veterans. My father was a veteran. It meant a lot to the veterans uh, to tell their story, and it really impacted me. Uh, for years to come. When I landed on that beach that day, the noise was tremendous. The shells are going off everywhere. Men are dying, getting killed, getting hit, wounded. And frankly, I was terrified. The year was 1944. The event, Operation Overlord. D-Day had arrived, a full-scale invasion on the coast of France by Allied forces trying to bring freedom to Europe. The USS Texas was there. 
whole bow of the ship would be down under the water as it bounced up and down. It would throw so much water back up all the way to the bridge where, where we would be here on the signal bridge. And it would throw enough water up on the signal bridge that it would slam you against the deck. Whenever the guns went off in that turret, why, well, it um, nearly shook you off of the <laughs> ship and uh, my phones flew off of my head and scared me half to death and he had to grab me and hold me, I think, the first time. My ears rang for about three weeks after it was all over and, of course, at the end of the day, our faces were black from the gunpowder and uh, it was really quite a show. A survivor of two world wars, the battleship Texas now rests proudly next to the San Jacinto Monument near Houston. But on this day, the 50th anniversary of D-Day, veterans have come to the Texas to remember their fallen comrades and a ship that changed their lives. Interesting time, a scary time, frequently. When I think of it now, I think of just how fortunate we were, those of us who did survive, because there was shells landing all around us. For many veterans, images of D-Day are still very clear. I scooped out a shallow spot that I could get closer to, to the earth with. And John Hooper was in the Army and part of the infantry assault at Omaha Beach. German artillery was landing in that area, and about five seconds later, one came a little closer, and another five seconds, another one came closer. And I said to myself, Hooper, if you don't get out of here, you're going to get the next one. So I got up and crawled and sort of ran or whatever I could do forward about 20 or 30 yards. Flopped down again when I heard another shell coming in and it exploded behind me as I turned around to look to see where it hit. And it hit that ramp that I just got off of. Men were still climbing off of that ramp. Pieces of the ramp flew into the air. It must have killed several of them. When we did get to the beach over there, we had to feel our way along to be sure we didn't hit a landmine. There were so many of them. You just sweat it out real good. They asked us if we had, uh, were Navy or Marines or what, you know, and said, no, we're Navy. He said, well, get all the ammo you can. We need all the help we can out here. So uh, never did see that person anymore. It's very emotional. I mean, you know, you just after, after it, you leave these things, then it gets real tough. Run! Alongside the guns, explosions, and chaos, the men on the battleship Texas were comforted by a voice, that of Chaplain LeGrand Moody. Captain of the ship called me in prior to the invasion. He said, Chaplain, more than 60% of our crew is below decks when we're at battle stations. And he says, I want you to come up to the bridge and take the loudspeaker system that goes all through the ship, take that microphone, and give a blow-by-blow -blow description of any action that we get into. First, the airplanes came over and dropped bombs on the beach, and then there were ships shooting. It looked like a gigantic Fourth of July. I, I, I'm reminded of some words by Louis L'Amour, the great Western writer. He said, there's nothing like gun smoke and sweat to draw men together. And you find that on a ship. I mean, we were, the jobs that we had, those men were sweating and the gun smoke was everywhere. The crew on this ship were like members of extended family, like some of your cousins or your brothers. And if you've watched this group around here, you'll see them shake hands and, oh, so glad to see you. Oh, I haven't seen you since so-and-so. It's just something special. 
about the Texas. So was the Texas your first ship after the transport on the Wyoming? That's right. Architect Steve Files has spent many hours on restoration efforts aboard the Texas. On this D-Day anniversary, he's tapping into the minds of veterans and researching parts of the ship rarely seen by visitors. These guys are still the guys who were in the spaces. They know what they did. They know what their buddies did. It's just like being in, <laughs> like being in jail. You couldn't get out of here until that was over with. <laughs> I think as far as going to a specific space, it, it's really good to get these guys down there because that can trigger memories that they don't even realize they've got. We're getting close to it now. Steering aft, where all the quartermasters lived. If you want to call it that. Uh, this is true deja vu. I was coming off watch, and uh, at midnight, I went past the galley, and I had seen this wooden box with the uh, armor's uh, ham on it. And when I got it down here, which was quite a feat, bringing it down three decks, we lowered it down. I think I asked somebody to help me. In any event, when we got it down here, we found out it was bacon. You see where the light is here? Yeah. That was all open, and you could literally go in there, and I hid it back there until the heat uh, subsided, maybe a month or so. Okay, I never thought I'd ever see this again. Getting that real close to the very stern. The skin of the ship was where, and this is where the rudder pierces the skin of the ship. That little story I was telling you, this is where I hid the bacon. I never thought I'd ever be back here. This is truly quite a sensation. For some veterans who served aboard the Texas, Coming home was as overwhelming as the battle itself. My family in Kentucky had heard on the radio that the Texas had been sunk. And I went home with my family thinking that I probably was dead. And I walked in and I suppose you can imagine what their surprise was. They were in shock. I didn't realize myself that the Texas had been reported some at the time. And of course they were crying and laughing. I guess we all got pretty emo emotional at that time. Crawling across that beach with, with the dead and wounded lying all over, wondering if I'm gonna make it. Fortunately, we did. And we were really thankful for the Navy for being able to silence those shore defenses. That was wonderful. I would like to meet the Navy chaps just to let them know that, well, hey, here, I survived. <laughs> My name is Henley. I was Henley. on the USS Texas during the invasion in Normandy. I was the director corner for the secondary battery on the port side. And I actually closed the cave when the guns fired, and I had a good telescope up there and I could see everything and see what was going on on the beach. Amazing. That's interesting. I'm certainly grateful for your support because my name is John Hooper and I landed with the 29th on a sector called, we were supposed to land on a sector called Easy Green. We landed on Easy Red on Omaha Beach. We were certainly grateful for your fire support. Hello, I remember this day. I shall too. <laughs> 50 years the blink of an eye, memories that last a lifetime.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.